recently the, they published their list of lineups on TV. I don't watch a whole lot of TV. A few shows I like, some of the old ones. I was looking at the title of one of the shows that came on last season called Motive. And that's with most crime shows, there's lots of them on there. They try to find the, the criminal by finding out what his motive is for the crime. Because there's always some motive. Often the motive's hidden and uh, the plot will go to one person and then they'll change the plot line, it'll go to, to another person until finally they, the culprit is exposed. Seldom are things done randomly, except in those plot lines where someone tries to uh, create a serial crime to hide the actual person that they wanted, that a single act, act might expose them. Dr. Phil made a statement popular when he said, there's a benefit in the behavior or the behavior would stop. And that's true. Today I want to talk about motivation. What are our motives? You know, Jesus Christ told us that God wants people to worship him in spirit and in truth. People with a pure heart. So I've titled this today, Seeking a Pure Heart. Because to understand our motivation is to understand ourselves and to get closer to God. We're familiar with Jeremiah 9 or Jeremiah 19, verse 9. It's one of the memory scriptures where it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And it's true. We can deceive ourselves. And verse 10 continues, with I, the Lord, search the hearts, try the reins to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God actually sees not only what you do, but why you do it. And he rewards that according to those reasons. The longtime members here remember a phrase that was made very popular in many ways by Herbert W. Armstrong when he said, the way of give versus the way of get. It's a simple concept, but a true one, and defines the fruit of our doings, really. It defines a motive for all we do. Do we do it to give to others? And we do it to get for ourselves. And I know it's better to give than receive, and someone has to receive for someone to give, so we do have to receive at times. I remember the famous movie line from Laurel and Hardy where there's two pieces of pie there, one's much bigger than the other one, and Ollie tells Stanley to go ahead and pick, and so Stanley picks the big one. And then Ollie says, well, Stanley, you know, if I were you and had chosen first, I would have taken the smaller piece. And of course, Stanley replies, well, why are you complaining? You got the one you wanted. <laughs> now, Ali didn't really want the smaller piece. He let Stanley pick first, so Stanley would be the courteous one and let him get the leftover bigger piece. And that's very often the, the case with us. Ali didn't really want the smaller piece, and often with our motives, we may take the smaller piece when we really wanted the bigger piece. My mom solved that problem when I was a kid because she would let my brother and I cut the cake and one cut and the other got to choose. So you learned to cut it pretty fairly or else you cheated yourself. The same motives can be true in our lives of why we do things if we don't truly look at ourselves the way God looks at us. We can desire a lot of wonderful things Things that may not be wrong of themselves. But what is our motive for these desires that we have? Is it money? The world seeks money. That's a big motivation. They put bounties on people to, to raise the price. Do we seek power? There are some people really want power. And when they get it, they won't let go of it. When it's taken away, they get angry. It's sad. We want respect. Certainly not a bad thing to have, but why, why do we want it? Perhaps intelligence. Some people want to be the smartest person. I like that. When I was in school, I chased the stars across the board. I wanted to be the first one to finish memorizing all the scriptures or get 100 on the test. What was my motive? All the stars, all the things. It's more selfish. Perhaps we want fame. And some people become famous. A lot of famous people in the Bible, good people, a lot of infamous people that did some wrong things, and we learned from both. But if these things that we desire come, did we come about it honestly? And even if we came about it honestly, did we have the right motive 
for acquiring it. That's where God tries the heart and tries the reins. We traveled a great deal in my early life. I remember being in Belgium with Mr. Armstrong once, and we went to the palace in Argentil, which we went to several times to see King Leopold. It was always sad in some ways and happy in others. Sad because to get there you had to drive through the war memorials of the First World War and all the graves of all the people who died. Heroes because they died for their countries. And probably most of them, like most young men, wanting to be heroes for a selfish reason. And then when you get in the war you don't really like it. You find out being a hero isn't what it's cracked up to be. But then we'd go to the palace at Argentu and the grounds were beautiful large gardens and we'd be met by the royal staff at the entry and we'd be ushered into a, a nice room where we'd wait and soon we'd be taken to a, a larger lounge where King Leopold and Princess Lillian would be. We discussed the projects that the foundation was doing with King Leopold and his foundation and we discussed those things and in one of the discussions as we were talking a young lady walked in in her 20s and we were introduced to her. Her name was Esmeralda. She was the princess, the youngest daughter of King Leopold. She's a beautiful girl, as most princesses are. After all, most kings don't marry unattractive people. And their progeny usually comes out fairly nice looking, as did she. And we went into the dining room after our discussion. We had lunch. Afterwards, though, on the way back, Mr. Armstrong asked me a question. I thought it was kind of funny because he commented on Princess Esmeralda and her beauty and he asked me, he said, did you ever wonder what it would be like to marry a princess? Well, I hadn't really thought about that. I suppose when I was young and saw Disney movies, Cinderella and those, I may have. I'd already married my princess and she was just as stunning as Esmeralda was, if not more so. So I, uh, my fantasies had already come true. But would you like to marry a princess? Would you like to make millions of dollars? Would you like to not have to pay any tax? I'd like that one. <laughs> Do you want everyone to respect you? Do you want fame? None of these desires are necessarily wrong by themselves, but let's face it, most of them have a selfish motive. Something to our own benefit. And we may even kid ourselves, we often do. I've heard people, you know, if I just won the lottery, if I had lots of money, I could, I could help my family, I could put my kids through college, I could help my aging parents, I could help my friends. I got my church. Wow, I could even help God. Now that sounds pretty arrogant and vain when you say it that way. But often people will think that way. It's selfish. And we can deceive ourselves when we have that selfish streak in us. A, a self-esteem weakness, perhaps. We all want to look good. That's innate in human nature, I think. We all want to be the hero, and being a hero is fine. But only if your motive is pure. Only if you have that pure heart. Because if you really look at it, what great act can we do that impresses God? It really isn't anything. I mean, Job learned that when God talked to him and said, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And we think perhaps he built the Great Pyramid, which is great, but that's only a speck in the universe, if that. I'd like to turn to a familiar story today and look at it maybe a little differently than we thought of before. It has a vill villain. It has a hero. It has a princess and has a promise of wealth and fame. Turn to 1 Samuel 17. It's a story we've all heard if you grew up in any type of religion, basically. You heard the story of David and Goliath. But I like to look at it from the standpoint of motives today, and how people think. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 1, it defines the enemy. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. And we're gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephedamnon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them, which is the way wars were fought. Back in those days, you just faced off and then marched toward each other. But the villain comes in next, verse 4, And there went on a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Now if you look that up, that's either 
at the bottom nine and a half feet, at the top 12 feet. 12 feet, he could stand up in this room. He'd have to duck for all the doorways. And you can imagine how large he was and how far his arm span was if you're 10 to 12 feet tall. Verse 5, we're told he had a helmet of brass on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. It's about 156 pounds when you look at the weight of a shekel. That was just his coat that he wore in the armor. He had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders for protection. You know, when you think about this guy, just, you wonder why he needed any protection. He could just put his hand out and kind of hold you off, and you'd be flailing away underneath trying to, trying to reach him. I doubt if I could reach him even with a three-foot sword. Anything longer than that, I wouldn't be able to carry it. But uh, even Shaq would probably look like a, a dwarf next to him. Verse 17, it says the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. So this man carried a telephone pole around with him. And his spearhead weighs 600 shekels of iron, about 19 pounds. Many of you have ever shot a shot put, which weighs less than that. You know how hard it would be to throw that, let alone a weaver's beam attached to it. But that was his shield, or that was his, his spear. And then someone else carried a shield in front of him. And again, I'm not sure who that person was, but I'm sure the shield was pretty heavy. And he stood and he cried to the armies of Israel and he said to them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Why are you all here? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come to me. So he says, just send one person out. I'll fight him. If he's able to fight with me and to kill me, then we'll be your servants. And if I prevail against him and kill him, you'll, you'll be our servants to serve us. Just that way the rest of us don't have to die. Just one person. It'll be over. And the Philistine said in verse 10, I defy the armies of Israel this day. I defy you. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now I'm sure Goliath was motivated by pride. He was pretty happy that he was the toughest kid on the block, the biggest guy in the army, could fight anybody. He was arrogant, obviously. He knew the deck was stacked in his favor. You know, if you're 12 foot tall, it's, I would say that's stacking the deck pretty good compared to everyone else. And here's your chance to be a hero. If you're motivated by wanting to be a hero, all you got to do is go out and kill this guy. That's all. And certainly your respect would be enormous. And you'd be a true, true patriot if you kill Goliath. There'd be a ticker tape parade for you. Would that be your motive, though, for fame? You'd be saving Israel. You could argue it that way. Verse 11, when Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They uh, knew they weren't big enough to take him on individually. Remember when I was in college, I used to play on a faculty team, and once in a while I'd play against Mike Carter, who was drafted by the Lakers. And he was, wasn't 12 foot tall, but he seemed it when he compared to me. And uh, if I played against him, I may as well just kiss it goodbye because I'm not going to shoot anything that's not going to be swatted away unless I can shoot half court shots but that would be like fighting against Goliath and they knew that and they were afraid of him because they saw that and to them probably discretion was the better part of valor because he would probably kill you and no one would fight him and he would come out and chant these chants against Israel against Israel's God and while the others were dreadfully afraid of this giant we're now introduced to David. David's ready to do battle. Personal glory would be his if he killed him, obviously, if he could triumph. And perhaps God put the fear of fighting this giant in the other men so that it could bring David to light. We don't know. God often does things like that. He works out things his way, not our way. I learned that many times when I would try to work out trips and travel in my past. People that God, I thought God would use, he didn't, and people that I didn't think he would use. He did. I take a lot of flack sometimes for that. I take a lot of flack for a Buddhist monk that I used to set up in Thailand. He uh, shaved his head every new moon like the Buddhist monks do, and he showed up in a saffron sheet. And I'd been praying for someone to help set up things there because the previous people that had set up things had bribed some people and done some things that uh, weren't 
proper. And I wasn't going to use any of them, and so I prayed to God to ask him to send me someone that I could use to help set up the, the trips there. And the next day, a bald-headed, orange-sheeted monk showed up at the college, wanted to see Mr. Armstrong. And I was surprised. And Mr. Armstrong met with him, and he had met some of our students, was impressed, and wanted to meet Mr. Armstrong. And Mr. Armstrong said, well, uh, you know, I go to Thailand quite often. I've always wanted to meet the queen, but I haven't been able to. And the monk said, well, I'm the queen's favorite protep, which is kind of like a cardinal in the Catholic Church. He was, I think, at that time, seventh in line to be the supreme patriarch of Buddhism. He made it to number three before he died. But it was interesting. He said, I can help you set it up. And I'm sitting there thinking, is this what God wants me to use? And sure enough, it was. He ended up helping us a great deal. He got us the presidential suite we used to pay $1,000 a night for for $300. He, uh, he seemed to be related to everybody in Thailand, even though he had never married anybody and he was a monk. But I guess it works differently over there. <laughs> but you use what God sends to you. And God does things differently. And perhaps he put the fear in some of these men who might have tried to go out and fight Goliath to not do so. But we see David now introduced in verse 12 of chapter 17. He was the son of the Ephrahite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, Jesse did. And the man was among men for an old man. So he was old. He'd already had eight sons, and David was his youngest. I don't know if he had any daughters. He probably did. It doesn't talk about those. His three eldest sons of Jesse followed Saul to the battle. They were going to fight. And they named his three sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema. And they went to war. They signed up to do their duty for their country. David was the youngest, we're told. Verse 14, and the three eldest followed Saul. And David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. Again, we all know he was a shepherd boy. And he would go back and forth. And it says the Philistines drew near every morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. The Philistine kept every morning he'd ridicule the Israelites, and in the evening he would ridicule them. Well, one day we're told in verse 17, Jesse told David his son, Take now for your brethren an ephah of this parched corn, these ten loaves, and run to the camp to your brothers, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of the thousands, and look to your brethren, see how they fare, and take this pledge to them. Now that was quite a bit of things for David to carry. He obviously wasn't a, a small lad. He was young. But he was pretty strong to run to the camp and run back and carry all these things. In verse 19, Saul and they and the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse has commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle as they would shout. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David was there in the trench. And David ran to see his brothers, like it says, verse 22. And verse 23, talk with them. And as he was talking, again, it must have been nearing the time for Goliath to come back out, there came up the champion, the giant, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. He heard them ridicule God. Ridicule Israel, the people of God. And he saw that the men fled when he came out. In verse 24, they fled from him and they were sore afraid. This giant. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy, defy Israel has he come. And it shall be that the man who kills him. Well, now comes some potential motives for killing Goliath. Number one, the king will enrich him with great riches. Wow, that's a good reason to do this. We talked about fame if you killed him, but now you get to get rich if you can kill this guy. You can do it for money. Put a bounty on his head. You, you can have all the money you want if you'll just take this guy out. And with riches is going to come respect, obviously. People often want to get rich. They buy lottery tickets, which doesn't kill them if they don't pick the right numbers although it kills them slowly and through poverty usually, people who buy them. And look at motive number two. It shall be the man who kills him. The king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter. Ah, you got to marry the princess. She's right there for you. 
Now, I'm sure Saul's daughter, Micah, was beautiful. And now you get to become the king's son-in-law because you get to marry his daughter if you do this thing. And that gives you entry to the palace and all the pageantry and all the beauty and things that go with it. You get the title of a prince by marriage. And for all you ladies, you get to be Cinderella every day if the shoe were on the other foot. So I was fascinated hearing all the lords and ladies in Europe when we'd be introduced to them, and they were really proud of their titles, Earl or Duke or Lord, Lady or whatever. Because if you had a title, you get invited to things and you wouldn't be shunned. It's a lot of vanity. In England, the title I learned went to the sons. That's why the Princess Diana's father was so anxious when he finally had a son. Because if you're an Earl and you have a son, he becomes the Earl. If you don't have a son, one of your brothers or one of their sons becomes the Earl. And not only do they become the Earl, but they get to live in the, in the mansion that belongs to the Earl. It doesn't belong to the family, it belongs to the Earl as such. And so if you don't have a son, you get pushed out of your house even. So that's how it worked with titles. People want those things and they like that. So we have some humanly desired motives that can go along with killing Goliath, motives of fame and riches, marriage, and the royal family. And look at number three. We have one more added to this thing. It shall be the man who kills him. He'll make rich with riches. We'll give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now your family won't have to pay taxes anymore. Now for me, that'd be a good enough reason to go after the guy anyway. Because if I won, I wouldn't pay taxes. If I lost, I wouldn't pay taxes either. <laughs> But it's interesting. If you win, you get the fame, you get your title by marriage, you get your money. Pretty good motives. But of course, this Goliath was a really big guy. All the soldiers and Saul were afraid because they saw a giant, someone that they couldn't defeat, bigger and stronger than they were. But what did David see in this? Verse 26, David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to this man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David saw a bigger picture. He saw a man defying God, his God, the God of Israel. Do we let others speak evil of our God, of our church, of our family? Do we shy away from our beliefs? We have the truth. People may think we're foolish for it, but yet I'm sure they thought David was foolish in thinking of killing Goliath. And David persisted, verse 27, the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now, again, money, the princess, and no taxes, and certainly the fame. So David knew the prize, but is that what it was about for him? It would have been their motive. Someone else would have tried to go out and fight him. And even David was judged for his motive. Look at verse 28. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why did you come here? You little whelp, what did you come here for anyway? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You're not doing your job. I know your pride the naughtiness of your heart, for you are come down that you might see the battle. You're just a looky loo. You're coming down here to watch and stir up things. That was a motive attributed by his oldest brother, the oldest son of Jesse. But David said, so wait a minute. He said, what have, what have I done? What have, what have I said? Other than this uncircumcised Philistine, he's defying God. Is there not a cause? Is this not a cause? Should not someone stand for the true God? Was this not the motive of David in his heart? To glorify God. To worship his God. To defend his God. He knew God didn't need that. But someone was defying his God. And who would stop this man who would defy the God of Israel? And he went... Verse 30, it talks about him talking to more men. He spoke after the same manner, and people answered him again and again. Again, money, love, and fame, and no taxes. 
Won't any of you fight this heathen? He's probably asking the men, trying to give courage to them. Verse 31, when the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul and sent for him. And David said to Saul, don't let your heart fail because of this giant. I'll go fight him, this Philistine. Was he bragging? Was he calling the others cowards, perhaps, in a sense? Was he telling them they lacked the faith that they needed to fight this giant? David would say, I can do it. Because David knew it wouldn't be him that was doing it. But Saul tells David, you're not able to go against this Philistine because you're just a, just a child. You're a youth. He's probably 17, 18. He's big enough. But no experience in fighting. And this Goliath has been trained as a soldier all his life. He'll kill you. And then David explains to him. He says, I keep my father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him. And I smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And he rose against me. I caught him by his beard, the lion, and smote him and slew him. Sounds a bit like bragging. I did this. I did this. But look at where he came next. Your servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. His motive was to glorify God. He knew God delivers each of us. And then Saul said, go and the Lord be with you. I can hardly imagine that. And then Saul gave David his armor. Here, put this on. Now David put on this various things and I'm sure in some ways, you know, if you see men on uniform and all the brass and all the things, you, you tend to think, wow, pretty impressive. And he armed him with his coat of mail. And to be seen in the king's armor with the king's sword would be kind of like holding Excalibur and walking out in the troops and you'd seem like you're pretty good. Kind of like when Mordecai and Haman, in the story of Esther, where Haman thinks he's being rewarded and he asked, the king asked Haman, what, would I, what should I do to honor someone? And wanting to honor Mordecai, but Haman thinks it's him, and he tells him, I'll put him on your horse and give him the royal clothes and give him all this stuff. That's where David was. He had the king's armor, the king's things on. But David, it says, he girded the sword on his armor, verse 39, but he decided not to go with that because he hadn't been trained with the sword. And he tells Saul, I can't go with these, and he took them off. Because it wasn't about him getting the king's clothes and the king's sword and going out there and defeating Goliath with the king's armor and sword. So he took what he knew, what God had trained him with. He took his slang and he picked up his stones and he went to the brook. And then he came to fight the Philistines, probably looking kind of like Peter Pan, small little guy with a slang and, and a shepherd's uniform. And he went out to face Goliath, the giant. And, the, and now the Philistine's there, the giant. And he looks in verse 42, and he saw David. Now, I'm sure he was expecting someone a little bigger, a little more experienced, perhaps even Saul. Saul was head and shoulders above most of the men of Israel. And Saul should have been the one leading. He should have been the one that had the faith to do this. But he didn't. And he sees David, and it says he disdained him. For he was a youth and ruddy and fair countenance. Of course, David might have looked a little older had he worn the uniform of Saul. And the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog that you come out here to throw sticks for me to fetch, stones at me? What are you doing, you little runt? <laughs> he ridicules him. And he says the Philistine cursed David by his God. So he was pretty upset that this boy had been sent out. Probably hurt his ego a little bit, too, to think that he's going to fight this kid. Probably doesn't even want to fight him. But David says to the Philistine, after the Philistine challenged him and says he's going to kill him and feed his flesh to the birds, and David answers back and says, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, 
the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. I'm here because you defied God. Not about me. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and will smite you and take your head from you. And he'll give your carcass, carcass to the hosts of the Philistines and all of them for the fowls of the air. And then in verse 47, when this is done, all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with the sword or the spear. It's not your 18 pound spearhead with your weaver's beam and your 156 pounds of armor you're carrying you. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. David's motive was to please God, to defend his beliefs, to know that God was behind him. And of course, we know what happened. He slew Goliath with a stone in his forehead. And when the big bully went down, and everybody likes to stand behind the bully, it says the Philistines fled, which is what happens when you take down a bully. All the people behind him that are tough guys in front of them. Behind the bully, tend to just run away. And they did. It was a great victory. But it was interesting because I often wonder if Saul even thought David had gone down to fight him. I mean, he'd talked to him and he'd offered him his, his sword and his armor. But look at verse 55. When Saul saw, Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the captain of the host, Whose son is this youth? Who, whose kid is this? Who is this? And Abner said, as my soul lives, king, I, I don't know. And he said, inquire whose son this little stripling is, this young lad. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philippines, and Abner took him and brought him before the king with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And he told him, I'm the son of Jesse, your servant. David made it about God, not about himself. It could have been about himself. He did marry Micah the king's daughter. He did achieve fame, and these things didn't seem to always work out for him that well because Micah ended up going with somebody else and his fame, Saul was jealous of it, tried to kill him, so it didn't always work out good. And sometimes when you do the right thing, for the right reason even, it doesn't always go well. Turn to Malachi 3, if you would. Malachi 3. Verse 14, Saul came, became jealous. He tried to kill David. It didn't work out, but it doesn't work out all the time. And people think it should often. Malachi 3 or 14 says, You have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinances? Do you do it for show? What profit is it that we did all this stuff, that we kept the Sabbath, that we tithe? We kept the holy days. You know, people look at us, they think we're funny, we're weird. Do you ever feel it's useless? Israel, Malachi talking to them, didn't think it paid to serve God. They wanted to pay off. What was their motive? I'm sure all of us at one time or another have felt that way. I did what God said and it didn't work. You ever said that? I have. Of course, it does work. God's way always works. It just doesn't work the way we want it, always. We don't always slay Goliath. Sometimes we lose, at least we appear to. Even Elijah, I thought to feel bad about that because all the great men of old had weak moments. Elijah would call down fire from heaven and I always think, what was he thinking? <coughs> that everybody would just worship the true God because, I mean, fire comes down at it takes the offering, it takes the altar, it takes the stones, it takes the water, you know, it takes the trench, everything. And then he has to flee for his life from Jezebel and complains to God, he's the only one. So we can be down sometimes, but obviously God hurt Elijah because Elijah did worship the true God. And we can have our moments of self-pity perhaps and wrong motivation, but we need to keep our eyes on God. Why we're here to serve God and to glorify him. Verse 14, continuing. You have said it's vain to serve God, and what profit is that we've kept his ordinances? And that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. We've 
walked mournfully. They wore clothes like sackcloth and ashes, and they did all the ritual things that they needed to show their righteousness toward God. But it was a show. What was their reason for it? They forgot Isaiah 58, where it says that, why do you fast? Isaiah 58, 4, keep your finger in Malachi, we'll go back to that. But he says, you fast for strife and debate. And God says, is this what you call a fast? You fast because you want your motives? You want it your way? And you want to call that an acceptable day to God? Do we take the outward show for true humility? The fact that you put on sackcloth and ashes and do that. Christ made it clear in Matthew 6 when he talked about motives there. When he talked about some of the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests and various ones who did everything out in the open. When Christ said, don't, uh, when you do your alms, don't sound the trumpet before you like the Pharisees do and the hypocrites. Why? Because they want the glory of men, he says. And he says, when you pray, don't do like the hypocrites because they pray loudly in the streets and the corners so that people can see them praying. You ever seen pictures of the Western Wall? You can see all the people praying there. Not bad people, but it's all seen of men. And he says, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. And, oh, I'm so hungry today. Oh, it's so terrible. I'm so righteous today. <laughs> Wrong motive. He says to wash your face and look like you're not fasting because it's before God because the motive has to be there. Why do you serve God? Sometimes it doesn't seem to work out. But is it about you or is it about God? Verse 15 of Malachi 3. And now we call the proud happy. The proud people seem to be happy. Remember the Pharisee and the publican in Luke 18 where, boy, God, I am so good. I just thank you that I'm not like these terrible, wicked people, the extortioners and these people that are unjust and adulterers and even this publican down here that I walk by. He was in his rich garments, I'm sure, and felt real good about himself. And now we see the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yes, they that tempt God are even delivered. Sometimes the righteous don't look like they prosper, and the wicked seem to. It seems the wicked do prevail. Indeed, Christ was innocent, and he died. And when he was being put on the cross, people were probably saying, yeah, see. Of course, he was resurrected. The Sanhedrin who pronounced guilt on him, they were guilty and they lived. I'm always amazed at criminals who know exactly where they were 27 days, 8 hours, and 37 minutes ago <laughs> when they're trying to give an alibi. And I can't even remember what happened 27 days ago because the innocent tend to not try to document their steps to have alibis. Why do you do what you do? Do you do it to profit yourself or do you do it to make the way of God look good. Ever make promises to God? God, if you do this, I'll do that. It's not wrong to ask God for things. But are you any better off than the wicked? They also ask their gods for things too. They offered their children to God in times of old. Do you serve God because you love him? Or do you expect him to compensate you for it? I want what I want. Again, you're back to motives. What is your motive? Do you want to be compensated for your good deeds that you do? Oftentimes I'd see the people around me. I worked in the dean of students' office in Pasadena for a time, and it was interesting. Some of the students would come in and talk to me. I was a class advisor, and a lot of them wanted to help, but quite often there would be some that would come in and tell me about one of their roommates had done something wrong. And it was interesting because I could... I could read with some of them the fact that they really weren't so concerned about their roommate. They were more concerned about showing their righteousness. Well, I didn't do that. And he's doing this evil thing, and we need to fix this. And it was interesting how I solved the problem with some of these people that would come in and do this, because I felt like they were doing this to make points, not to help their fellow student. And so I would ask them, does anybody else know about this problem? And they would say, oh, yes. And I would say, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to go tell one of those people who knows 
to come into the dean of students and tell him about the problem. Because you won't get any points for it. Nine times out of ten, they never told the other person to come in because they really weren't that concerned about the other person. They were more concerned about getting points for themselves. Was it a good thing to do to help your fellows? Yes, it was. And if it was a severe thing, I made sure they, they were talked to. Most of the time, it wasn't that severe. Usually, it was, they'd talk about some kind of music or loud music or whatever. And I'd always ask him, well, if I called that person in, would he say that uh, you went to him? Because I always say, if you got to your brother, oh, yes, I went to him. I told him how terrible that was. And I say, if I call him in, would he say you went to him? Because at times I'd talk to him and I'd say, did uh, somebody talk to you about your music? No. You sure? Well, no. Well, come to think of it, somebody thought I might play it a little bit loud, but it wasn't that big, big a deal. You really hadn't gone. I mean, when you go to your brother, they have to know you went to your brother. But what's the motive? Is it about righteousness and being your brother's keeper and helping? God wants us to have the right motive, the right things, doing it for the right reason. Verse 16, there is a reward. It says, those that fear the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. If your motives are right and you're looking for God, there's, you're in a book. God has that book. We read about it in Revelation, the book of life. There is a reward, but that reward only comes with right motivation in your quest for the kingdom of God. The reward isn't now. Verse 17, that's, they, should, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In that day, when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son and serves him. When? In that day. It's later. We do it because it's the right thing to do. And we do it now, even though reward isn't now. Reward is later. God tells us how to have that right motivation in your quest for the kingdom of God. It's summed up in the key, humble yourself. Humble yourself. James 4.10, it says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Do you want to be lifted up by God? Humble yourself. 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You want to be exalted? Humble yourself. Matthew 18, Christ says, who shall humble himself as a little child, the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You want to be great in the kingdom? Humble yourself. When you're humble, you do things for the right reason. You try to help other people. Your motives are pure, and you have a pure heart. Humbling yourself is one of the continual themes in the Scripture that God tells us to do. All through the Scriptures, we see God doing mighty things through what we call mighty men. But it was through these men who humbled themselves, who saw it was God, not them. God can work through us if we're humble, but He can't work through us if we're full of pride. The great men of old were great because they glorified God, not because they were 12 foot tall and could beat everybody up. Proverbs 8, verse 13. Solomon came to the conclusion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Why does he hate it? Because you can't serve God. You can't have the right motive. If you have pride, pride's about self. Arrogance is about self. Being evil is to profit the self. Do you hate pride? It stands in the way of your serving God the way he wants you to. That's the problem with pride. Pride says, I'll serve God, but I'll do it my way. Humility says, I'll serve God his way. Are you motivated by pride or humility? With pride, you fail. With humility, you succeed. Proper motivation is critical with God. Absolutely critical. Doing the right things for the wrong reason is better than doing the wrong thing. But improper motivation may well be idolatry. Because an improper 
motivation focuses on yourself and the approval of others. And we're to seek the approval of God and of his son Christ. Some people go through the right religious motions. You can see that in most of the religions where they spin prayer wheels, they the Hajj, they crawl on their knees for miles in the desert. They do these religious things, but for the wrong reasons. It might make them look good. And we all do things sometimes that try to make ourselves look good. There's nothing wrong with doing things for the right reasons. But God wants a heart that has repented from the sin of seeking self-glory. And one that seeks his way. Look at Matthew 6.33. You know it by heart. We quote it by heart. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Do you realize if you stop right there, in that part of the verse, we miss the point? Because this can be selfish. I mean, how many people who believe they go to heaven when they die, how many people want to be good because they want to go to heaven? I mean, heaven is described as not a lot of fun in most religions, but it sure beats the alternative. Right? Most people want to avoid hell more than they want to go to heaven. Most people fear pain. But it's interesting, if we just seek the kingdom of God and we stop there, that can be selfish. But if we finish the rest of the verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added to you. You can't have a wrong motive for seeking the kingdom if you add his righteousness. Because his righteousness is not selfish. It's a pure heart. He wants you and me to be controlled by his love, motivated to show his glory and his righteousness. We acknowledge his authority. We acknowledge that he's God. Paul talks in Ephesians about servants being obedient to their masters because we are under authority, the authority of God. Respecting authority is respecting God. Even man's authority, which we're told to respect, which is pretty hard to do with some of the people in power, a lot of unjust people. But God does work these things out if we have the right motive and do it right. We have to regularly evaluate ourselves against his standards, not our own. And we may get ridiculed for it by our coworkers, by fellow students in the world. It's the nice part of ABC is we're all going the same direction, which is nice. But what does it mean to have a pure heart? It's not to seek the approval of men, the applause and the recognition of men or women. It's seeking the approval of God. Now, if recognition of men comes, like it did for David, and it has for other great men, that's fine, as long as you direct the glory to God. But don't hold your breath for human approval. It's pretty rare in this world. But we have to learn to obey with sincere motives and willing hearts doing the things outwardly that reflect our heart inwardly. When we finally get to the point that we want to do what God says for the right reasons, and we don't want to do what the world wants for selfish motives, then we finally begin to have a pure heart. I've done a lot of things for the, the right things in my life, reluctantly, many of them, just as you all have. Children are good at that. As a child, I did a lot of the right things reluctantly because the alternative was a sore rear end. And so I did it. I should have wanted to do it, but I didn't want to do it. God seeks those who willingly, eagerly, and readily seek his glory in what they do and say. The right reasons. When you do that, you actually prove to God you have faith. And David standing up for God proved he had faith in God. It doesn't take faith to get your reward now. If you get your reward now, it's not faith. It takes faith to know it's coming at Christ's return. Pride destroys the heart, creates raw motives and destroys faith. Humility lifts God's up and builds faith. We need to keep striving for that. Colossians 3 and verse 23 and 4, it says, when Paul's writing to them, looking at your work, and wanting a reward. He says, whatever you do, do your work heartily. Yeah, work hard. 
as for the Lord rather than for men. Do you feel like you're working for God in your job? Or do you feel like you're just putting your time in? Knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. If you do right with men, you're doing right with God. It's the Lord whom you serve. All of us work for God. In our actions, in our lives, what we do, the goal is to come to a place where we do our service for His glory with all of our hearts. And that we can be assured of our rewards in the honor of His name and advancing His kingdom. This is who Christ wants us to be, those motivated by a pure heart, not self-seeking, but desiring to reflect God, to reflect Jesus Christ. What should be our desired motivation? Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2 verse 9, it has to be the motive of God and Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 2 verse 9, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, Again, he was at the right hand of God. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He died for you. He died for me. He died for David. He died for Goliath, in that matter. He did nothing wrong. Totally unselfish act. We had nothing we could do for him, and he had everything he could do for us. Verse 10, for it became him for whom all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. Is our desire to bring many sons to glory? To help them? We can't save them. Only Christ's blood does that. But we can help them. We can serve. He's our captain to make our salvation perfect through suffering. He suffered, making our salvation available through the hope of the resurrection. We win in the end. But our desire can't be simply winning. You see, you don't need to slay Goliath to be someone. In fact, if you slayed a Goliath, it'd probably destroy you. Most people can't handle the fame. Very few people in history have without it destroying them in some way. You don't need the wealth of kings because if you look at money, you look at those who have it, that also would likely destroy you. You don't need to marry the princess or that prince on that white horse. In fact, usually you find the white horse is just a nag. <laughs> it's only white while you're looking through the rose-colored glasses. Unfortunately, you do have to pay your taxes. The only way to a pure heart, though, is to put on the true humility, where Christ humbled himself to be willing to die, and the mind of Christ where he said, not my will, but thine. The will of the Father that sent him, the will of the Father who begot us, to be like our older brother. David may have slung the stone, but God killed Goliath because David's motive was to glorify God. Because Goliath was there and David came in the name of the Lord of hosts. It wasn't about him, it was about God. May each of us come to the point where we are about the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and that everything that we do in our lives is motivated by love, motivated by the glory of God, and the glory of Jesus Christ, his son, and our older brother. If we come to that position of humility, to where we do things with a pure heart, then truly at that point we've created in ourselves the pure heart that God desires.